Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, what, I, what can I say? What a pleasure, what, a, what an honour it is to be speaking at what I gather is the, the number one um, crypto conference in the whole of Cluj, Napoca, uh, this Friday morning. And um, so my name's Dominic, Dominic Frisbee, and this presentation is called The Future of Work, Tax and Money, and just a little bit about who I am. I wrote this book back in 2013-2014, uh, which was the first book on uh, Bitcoin from a, from a recognized publisher, and, I, and it's also the best book uh, ever written uh, on Bitcoin, um, according to my mother. And, um, but unfortunately, it never got a distribution due to the lack of foresight among the uh, publishing houses, the backward analog publishing houses of the world. It never got a, a distribution beyond um, the, uh, the shores of the once great nation of Britain. And um, so it's sort of little known beyond, beyond Britain. But if, if you go to England and you type in um, Bitcoin into Amazon, it will come up first. But if you go to probably Romania and type in Bitcoin into Amazon, it'll come up about... 87th or something like that. Um, but, uh, and Richard Branson said it, it, read it and glimpse into the future, um, although it's not actually clear to me that he did actually read it. Um, now, um, now, when you, I, I often get invited onto British TV to talk about Bitcoin, and inevitably you'll be put on a panel and there'll be a couple of journalists from the Financial Times, uh, there'll be somebody uh, from, the, um, from the BBC, and there'll be somebody else from The Economist, and they will all tell you it is tulips um, and you know Bitcoin is a bubble it's tulips now so it's important at this point to um, define what is a bubble and so we'll start ladies and gentlemen with my definition of a bubble a bubble is a bull market in which you don't have a position um, and that is the reason that so many people uh, will dismiss Bitcoin as a bubble. None of them own it. They're all no-coiners. And we need bubbles. Now, they compared it to tulips. Now, the tulip bubble happened in Amsterdam in 1627. And here we are almost 400 years later. And Amsterdam remains the global hub of the flower industry. That tulip bubble built an industry that has brought prosperity to Holland for some 400 years and will continue uh, uh, bringing prosperity to um, Holland. We need bubbles. Bubbles are essential. Without the railway bubble, the railways in the United Kingdom and America would never have been built. Without the uh, dot-com bubble, so much of the infrastructure that we require for the internet would never have been built, and so on and so forth. We need bubbles. They accelerate investment. So when somebody tells you it's a bubble and dismisses it, forgive them, for they know not what they're saying. Now, so the next question we have to wonder is how big can crypto get, ladies and gentlemen? And I can see lots of young faces in the room, and you won't remember these times, but every decade we seem to get a, there seems to be a go-to um, asset that becomes the, the mania of that decade. And so, for example, gold was the mania in the 1970s. Gold and gold mining shares and all the inflation of the 1970s. Then we had the 1980s and Japan, of course, was the bubble of the 1980s and um, all sorts of crazy stories about Japanese valuations occurred towards the end of that um, decade. Then we had dot-com in the 1990s and, of course, natural resources, commodities in the noughties. And behind each of those huge narratives, there was a, uh, each of those bubbles, there was a very strong narrative, uh, a story that made investment in that sector deeply compelling. For example, in the case of commodities, uh, you know, we're running out of oil. The, Japanese, uh, the Chinese middle class need all these copper and so on. There's always, to, to build their enormous infrastructure, there's always a compelling story. And crypto is very much the bubble of this decade. Now, by the end of the 1970s, the value of gold and gold shares worldwide was equivalent to the entire market cap of the S&P. 
And the same thing happened with Japanese shares in the 1980s. Dot com, by the year 2000, the value of all um, tech stocks worldwide was equivalent to the value of the S&P, and the same happened with natural resources in 2011. So let's compare some valuations now. The S&P 500 currently has a market cap of $26 trillion. And I've put some comparables on there just to give you an idea of how big $26 trillion is. We forget just how big a trillion is. Um, I could um, spend a million dollars every day since the day that Jesus Christ was born in the year zero, except it wasn't the year zero, but let's just assume it was the year zero. I could spend a million dollars every day since then, and I still wouldn't have spent a trillion dollars. That's how big a trillion is. And the S&P has a valuation of 26 trillion. The FTSE um, is about a tenth of that. There's Shell, um, biggest oil company in the world, um, apart from Exxon, 230 billion. All of crypto currently has a value of 230 billion. Um, all the gold in the world, 9 trillion. HSBC, 150 uh, billion. And, and, and JP Morgan has overtaken crypto uh, again uh, to become the world's leading bank. But that is a temporary position, as we all know. Now, so that gives you an idea. So crypto could, the, the value of the entire crypto market could go up 100 times to find an equivalent value um, uh, uh, to the market cap of the S&P. And that would be consistent with the bubbles of previous decades. I'm not saying it will do that, but I'm saying it's possible. Now, why... What is the future of money? Why is adoption of cryptocurrency inevitable? And to understand this, we go all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia. And here, humans lived here, uh, nomadic people in the Zagros Mountains. And as the seas receded from the valleys um, around the Tigris and the Euphrates, human beings, nomadic people, came down from the hills. And they found something in this valley that proved extremely useful. Now, what they found Oh, was this. They found mud. Now, that was not a human being coming down from the Zagros Mountains. That was actually a human being at the Glastonbury Festival. But the dynamic is the same. And they found all sorts of uses for this mud. Um, it made pots. Um, they, could use, they used it to make tools, sickles, axes, hammers, even nails, weapons, of course. They found if you bake the mud with straw in the sun, it built bricks, and those bricks built the first homes, which became the first cities. The mud gave them crop yields, the like of which they'd never known. And so for the first time, human beings started producing more than the bare essentials they needed to survive. And so they began to trade. And so that mud found another use. Now, we tend to believe that gold or shells or whale's teeth was the first form of money. In fact, the first form of money was mud. Little bits of tokens representing certain items, a cone for a measure of barley, uh, two cones would be two measures of barley, um, a disc for a sheep or two discs would be two sheep and so on. And these um, items were baked inside clay balls and thus um, was a, a record of a debt owed and usually that debt would be some form of tax or a tithe and when that debt was settled the clay ball was smashed open and the debt was settled so what you see here is an, the earliest form of money but also the earliest form of record keeping it was a blockchain basically and over time people found that rather than have these tokens and bake them inside clay balls. It was more effective instead to inscribe the mud instead. And so we had the first system of writing was developed around money and taxes. And that's the modern equivalent. And um, thus, so we have this relationship, ladies and gents, between money and technology. And throughout history, money has evolved as technology has evolved. First, they used this mud, this clay. Then means were found to cast coins, where you could certify the amount of metal in a coin, and the franc would authenticate the quality of the metal. And when the printing press was invented, and we believe we invented it in Europe, but of course it was invented some 600 years earlier in China, 
and Marco Polo describes going to China and how marvelling at how they used bits of paper as though it were gold itself. And so when the printing press was invented, we started to use paper money instead of gold, instead of real metal. And then with the advent of digital technology in the 80s and 90s, so did we start to use digital money instead of paper money. And in fact now, only 3% of all the money that exists in the world exists in physical form. 97% of money um, is digital. And now we have the latest evolution in this technical story of money, cryptography. And the technology, money is tech, and technological advancement means the adoption of crypto is inevitable. There is another dynamic in, at play in our global economy, and this is the move from tangible to intangible assets. In 1990, if you look at the three biggest companies in Silicon Valley, they had a total market cap of 36 billion and employed one million people. If you compare that today, um, they employ a quarter of as many people, and yet their market cap is some 60 times higher. And we've seen this extraordinary valuation ascribed to intangible assets, to the intangible economy. There we have Facebook employs 25,000 people full-time, Google 88,000, Apple 120,000 um, employees. It's not that the analog economy has disappeared. We still have Shell, we still have factories, we still have cars. It's just the intangible economy is so much more scalable. If you think, you've, and, and you see this reflected in the valuations, Amazon, Walmart has greater cash flow than Amazon does, yet Amazon has a far bigger market cap. Netflix has a bigger market cap than Disney. Facebook and Google have eclipsed Penguin Random House or the New York Times. And something similar is happening with money. We are moving from tangible to intangible. And the reason is this sheer scalability of intangible assets. Um, you could design a brilliant app and you can upload it to the App Store, and that app can be downloaded a million or a billion times. Let's say you design the best pen in the world. You've still got to manufacture millions of those pens and find a way of distributing them worldwide. Physical objects are not as scalable as digital. And this is another reason why we will see the adoption of crypto. National currencies are not as scalable as cryptocurrency because national currencies are limited by borders. Cryptocurrency has no such limit on it, and particularly Bitcoin. It's just so much more scalable. And already in the world, more people have a smartphone than have a toilet. Um, I was walking past the homeless charity in St. Martin in the Fields in London the other day, and they're all sat against the wall in the morning waiting for their breakfast, all of, all of the homeless playing on smartphones. It's, we've seen that everyone has a smartphone now. And if you think of how many unbanked there are in the world, two, three billion, whatever the number is, they're all going to get a smartphone much quicker than they're going to get any kind of financial inclusion. And it's a very quick route from a smartphone into financial inclusion and it will just be easier for them to use crypto than it will be national currencies, for which is required some kind of bank account. And I know it's the devil, I know it's evil, and I know it's everything that's wrong in the world, but if you just look at the sheer scalability of Libra, I think Libra is going to be huge. Facebook has 2.4 billion accounts worldwide. WhatsApp already has 1.5 billion users, 300 million users in India alone, many of whom are not financially included. I know Libra is going to hit millions of regulatory hurdles. It's no coincidence that that white paper was published in Asian hours. That's its first market. market. Zuck, Zuckerberg has got previous. He's not an originator. He's very good at looking at other ideas that are floating around at the time, taking them and making them his own. He's got previous with Facebook and um, whatever, MySpace. He's quite clearly copying Bitcoin. He's using all the same arguments, take, and, and Libra is not finite. 
in the same way that a national currency is finite. I just think it's going to be enormous. The problem with Libra, of course, is that it's based on fiat money. It's a stable coin. And so it won't hold its value in the same way that something, uh, the um, supply of which is finite, will uh, retain its value. But the next big problem, so all this just means the mass adoption of cryptocurrency in all its many forms. Now, the big problem is going to be taxing Libra. It's not going to be easy. Which brings us to our next subject. And this is my new book, which comes out next week, ladies and gentlemen. Yay! The, it's called Daylight Robbery. <laughs> How tax has shaped our past and will change our future. And all this shit is in that book. And I can tell you, it is going to be the world's number one book about the past, present, and future of taxation. Now, um, <laughs> the only book. Now, let me ask you all a question. Please put your hands up if you have more than one income stream, if you're a freelancer of some kind, you have various jobs, you work for yourself. I'm going to say 80, 90% of the room. Please put your hands up if you have one job working for one employer. That's three, four of you. Okay. You guys, the four of you who have one job working for one employer, are history. As we go... <laughs> As we go forward, more and more of us are becoming freelancers of some kind. Now, this is going to be a huge, huge problem for government. Um, the traditional employment model where you work for one company for an extended period of time, perhaps your whole life, it's dead. More and more people are working from home. There's more and more freelancers. The gig economy is on the rise. And Ernst and Young, the accountants, have forecast that by 2030, 50% of the world's workers will be contingent. 50% will be freelancers. Already here, you've seen in enlightened spaces such as Romanian Bitcoin communities, 80 or 90% are already freelancers. And in 2035, the population will be 9 billion. Um, six billion of whom will be workers. That means three billion freelancers in the global economy, half the world's workforce. Now, that, keep that statistic in your mind. And then the, the next evolution from freelancers is the digital nomad. And just as the internet is borderless and the digital economy is borderless, so are workers becoming borderless as well. Many leave their own countries because house prices are too high and travel is so cheap. The internet is so good wherever you go in the world. And the most expensive, as you enter the digital economy and no nomadic lifestyle, the most expensive purchase in your entire life is removed. Can anyone tell me what is the most expensive purchase you ever make in your life? A house. You're wrong. It's your government. Uh, th that is by far and away the most expensive purchase. Um, and uh, over the course of your lifetime in the developed world, roughly 50% of everything you ever earn is taken from you in taxes. It's an extraordinary number by the time you factor in the um, accumulation over time. These, this workforce, it's, it, it, it's predicted that one in three freelancers will be a digital nomad of some kind. That means one billion digital nomads around the world. Where do they pay tax? Who to? It's not that clear. If you sp spend more than 183 days in one country, then you become, technically you pay tax to that country, but it's just not clear. The tax laws are from an analog age. They haven't kept up, kept up with the new um, digital intangible economy. Now, and by the way, f at least 50% of digital nomads operate in the um, uh, crypto economy at the moment already. Now, 50% of government revenue worldwide comes from income tax. 50%. And that is an, it's become that way because it's an easy tax to collect. It's collected at source. Before you receive the money, the employer deducts it from your pay and gives it to your government. But if the workforce, half the workforce, is now freelance, it is going to become a much harder tax to collect. Um, some people will deliberately avoid it. Some people just find more expenses to write off against it for all sorts of different reasons. Um, 
there's much more incompetence. Um, many giggers in the US, it's an extraordinary number. It's like 20% of people working in the gig economy in the US didn't even realize they had to file tax returns. And if you think of how governments are already struggling to tax, tax intangible corporations, Google and Apple and so on, with all their multinational, international um, uh, patent laws in, registered in different jurisdictions, they're going to find it just as hard to tax the um, intangible workforce, the nomadic workforce. Nomads don't live in the country of their origin. They don't use government services. Often, they're quite libertarian in their mindset. They feel very little obligation, very little duty. It's no coincidence, by the way, that tax is your duty. All sorts of manipulative words have been used in history in order to uh, guilt you into paying. So the big question that governments have, the big problem, is they're already running deficits, spending more than they collect. How are they going to replace this lost revenue from income tax? So we're going into a world where higher consumption taxes are likely, higher VAT. We'll probably see land value taxes of some kind and wealth taxes. We're going to see more inflation, more debasement of money, more... This narrative in the UK is very big at the moment. People's quantitative easing where money is spent not to buy financial assets, but to uh, spend on infrastructure. Um, this new thing of modern monetary theory is gaining more and more traction amongst economists. And you're going to see this more aggressive collection of taxes as the pressures of government grow. And already, um, most tax bodies are, are out of control when it comes to aggressive collection. More surveillance, all that kind of thing. But... We'll also see this thing, you see how Ireland, for example, made itself a desirable country of business by lowering its tax rates. You will see more and more tax competition between countries. And you will see many countries will, will actually want to attract digital nomads and the freelance workforce. And so they will lower their tax rates. And this tax competition and those countries that have low tax rates will succeed. Those that have high tax rates will, be, will get left behind. Already in China, they have one city that's been designed to attract, a whole city designed to attract the nomadic workforce. And I think you're going to see two, just as we have sort of two classes of econo economy, um, where the intangible economy gets taxed at one rate and the, in, and the tangible economy gets taxed at another. Like, just for example, at the moment, say I order, you know, a, a, this thing on Amazon and it arrives at my house, this... this thing has, has made the journey um, to my house through various customs portals and all the rest of it, and so it's taxed. But if, let's say I order this thing and I get it 3D printed, where, who pays the tax? Suddenly it just bypasses all the traditional tax collection mechanisms. It's so hard to tax the intangible economy. And you're going to see two classes of people, I think. As one is this nomadic freelancer, what... Um, uh, Lord Rees-Mogg called the sovereign individual who pays much lower rates of tax and travels around the world. And you're going to see those who, for whatever reason, are trapped at home and they will face this increasing tax burden. And if the nature of tax changes, it's inevitable that the nature of government is going to change as well. And you'll see tech Already we're starting to see tech replace government services. Uber is already almost as cheap as the Tube in London, uh, if there are two of you travelling. You'll see more and more tech used in education. You'll see more and more people are embracing tech in their healthcare. And it will just be better than government supplied services. So as governments find themselves restricted, um, in their income, at the same time, their services are going to be offered by, for free in most cases by tech, and this raises another issue which we'll come to in a second. Um, and they'll be done better. So these huge forces are going to change the world in which we live over the next 30 or 40 years. And this brings us to my big sort of thesis that I have about the world at the moment, and this is that the next N the narrative that drives the next big bull market in tech is going to be privacy. Have I missed a slide? No. Um, and in this regard, um, me and a couple of buddies, well, I'll talk to you in a sec. This great line from Shakespeare, who are you? 
Why do you hide in the darkness and listen to my private thoughts? So the other day, I was going, um, my friend, my f rich oil trader friend has a chalet in the Alps and we were going to the Alps to go and stay in his chalet and I was talking to my daughter in the house and I said, I don't know whether to bring my Timberlands or my hiking boots. Which should I bring, my Timberlands or my hiking boots? And my daughter said, I think you should bring your Timberlands, Dad. And I said, yeah, but they're a bit old and tatty. That was the conversation. And it was in the hall outside my daughter's bedroom at about 10 o'clock at night. I then got, on, got into bed and I started fannying around on my phone. And Amazon is trying to sell me Timberland boots. How did it know? And there's another story where I literally, I needed a new pair of slippers, okay? And I just looked at my slippers and I thought they looked so, so old and tacky. And I just thought to myself, I need a new pair of slippers. I didn't even discuss it with anyone. And I go on my computer and Amazon's trying to sell me slippers. How does it know? And your phone is listening to you. If you've got an Alexa, that's listening to you. But it's not just benevolent corporations trying to sell you stuff that are listening to. We don't know who's listening to. Are we, is, 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 GCA, is Edward Snowden's captors listening to us? Is the Russian government? Is the Chinese? The, the US? Who's listening? We don't know. But it's going on. For sure it is going on. Bots are, are invading our privacy. And we have given our privacy away without realizing what we were given away. The whole world, you know, Google and all this stuff. When the internet is free, you are the product. We did not know what we were giving away, but it's been given away. Now, if I have a relationship, say, for example, with my lover, I'm going to tell my lover stuff that I would not tell my lawyer or my accountant, for example, or my wife. Um, I don't have a wife. <laughs> and similarly, if I have a relationship with my accountant, I might tell him stuff that I wouldn't tell my taxi driver. You share different information with different people according to what that relationship is. And that relationship, that information, should not be supplied to anyone else. Yet currently, what we say, what we read, what we watch, what we buy, what we share, what we sell, all this information gets used, gets taken and used for purposes beyond which it was initially supplied. So that inherent nature of that relationship is abused. And that information is then used for all sorts of purposes. It's used to shape your behavior, what you do, what you watch, what you see, what you read, what you buy, what you sell. It's used to determine the information and the content that you receive. It's used to sell things to you. It's used to help other people make decisions about you, whether you're a good insurance risk, whether we can lend you this money, whether you should get this job. It's used to spy on you. And in bad hands, it can get used against you in some way. And you don't know what data is being used. You don't know how it's being used, by whom it's being used. You guys, we've all got an idea because we work in the enlightened world of crypto. But most people have no idea. And you have no say in its use. You have very little ability to object. And you have no power to amend that information. You've got no control. And this is a narrative that is, it's already gaining some traction. I'm just convinced it's going to get bigger and bigger. If you could find ways to protect your privacy, that limits the ability that other has, others have to use information about you beyond the scope for which it was supplied. And so ultimately, if you protect your privacy, you are protecting yourself. And you guys are all doing it. You're at the, the coalface of it. But new technologies, new protocols, new coins are all being developed to protect privacy. And new companies are emerging with the same goal. And so me and a few friends, we've set up this company, Cypherpunk Holdings. I can't think who it's named after. Um, and the idea of this company is our aim is to become, well, our thesis is this. It's that privacy is undervalued. 
it's been we've given it away without realizing what we've given away and it's ultimately it's been mispriced by the market but attitudes are changing people are waking up to its importance and as they do all these technologies and coins are going to get have see bigger and bigger demand some are going to some people are prepared to pay a premium to protect their privacy. And as public awareness of this takes hold, you're going to get this huge narrative. And every bull market needs a story. It needs a narrative that drives it. And, and, and I'm going to try and make privacy the next big bull market narrative. Um, and so our mission with this company, Cypherpunk Holdings, is to build the world's leading privacy investment vehicle. And so we're looking around for coins and companies that have good privacy. Now, this is sort of what our target portfolio is going to be. We were going to be 50% companies, 50% coins. But because of all the shenanigans in the North American markets getting an ETF listed, the, um, some of the old fogies in the company have determined that we go more into coins because um, for normal investors, crypto is still very difficult to invest in. So we're going to be 65% coins. 30% um, equities, that should say 30%, I don't know why it says 45, and 5% 5 in cash. And we developed this thing called the Cypherpunk Index of Privacy Coins, where we ranked all the different um, privacy coins according to five different criteria, usage, how used they are, how scalable they are, how private they are, what the market cap of the coin is, and how decentralized they are. And so, for example, here we have Bitcoin. Um, it ranks very high on usage. It ranks very high on decentralization. It ranks very high on market cap. It's not that private. You know, the blockchain isn't that private, so it ranks low there. Uh, it can be made private, as we all know. And um, there are some scalability issues, so it ranks low there. And we compare that to something like Grin, which, um, which wants Grin blue. Um, you know, it ver ranks very low on usage, but it's very scalable and it's very private. It's quite a nice little dinky thing we've invented that you can uh, go and look at and uh, argue with us about whether we're right or wrong. And initially, a year ago when we set this up, we wanted to hold a portfolio of private coins, but now we've become sort of Bitcoin maximalists. And so um, Monero is our current favorite of the privacy coins, but um, we are something like 90% uh, in Bitcoin and 10% in Monero. That's sort of our allocation. But that, that might change as the new technologies develop. And here are a couple of the companies that we've invested in. Uh, Samurai Wallet, some of you may know. Uh, we invested in Chia. Hydro 66 is a data center um, in Sweden. Long story behind that one, but it was before our time. And, um, uh, here are some of the people, God knows what happened there. Me, Dominic Frisby, Mo Adams, some of you may know, and a third um, uh, uh, member of the team is John Matonis, uh, you know, an OG who some of you may know. And um, that's our company. We're listed on the Canadian stock market, five cents. We're trading at below NAV, and, um, and uh, there's some numbers about our company. Um, um, and uh, we're growing all the time, but we're, we're going to get the share price up and raise some more money and conquer the world is the basic plan, uh, but privately. And um, so that's where we are with that. And I wanted to say one last thing. Um, we've got this... Um, am I doing on time? We've got this... Uh, these are all our security and operations partners. Um, we've had this, I was late for my flight yesterday because of this stupid um, Extinction Rebellion movement going on in London. And ev oh my God, the UK has just gone totally apeshit. But the, um, in so many different regards, but everyone keeps complaining about how bad the world is. And, you know, with this problem and that problem, the fact is, the world, as we advance as human beings, the world is getting better every single day. And there has never been, the later you are born, the more lucky you are um, because, because of that single fact that the world is getting better every day. And quite frankly, there has never been a better time to be alive. And so I wanted to remind uh, you of that as I finish this talk. We are very lucky to be alive today when we are alive. There have been much worse times in history to be alive. So if you're inclined to start moaning, stop it. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gents. Thank you.